Hi, everyone. Welcome. Hi, guys. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Mia. I am one of the producers of Tomofest, and we're really excited for this session. Uh, this is Show and Tell Art Training, How Artistic Practices Can Adopt Machine Learning. And we're joined by some wonderful guests. So your hosts today will be Derek Schultz and Leah Coleman. Derek is an artist working at the intersection of art and ML, whose interests explore multisensory perception, generative abstraction, and the future of ecology. And Leah is an artist, AI researcher, and educator focused on creative coding for public art and online education. Uh, they teach ML art courses, and that's where this great lineup of speakers comes from today. So a big thank you to Esteban, Naoko, Adam, and April for sharing your projects with us today. Um, before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors for their support of Twimblefest and today's session. Um, also a quick note, since today's session is hosted on Zoom, just take a second to note where the chat is. There will be time for a Q&A at the end, so please feel free to send your questions in there. We'll be monitoring the chat. Um, and if you're watching on YouTube, we can see your questions there as well, so feel free to send anything through the YouTube chat. Um, and that's all I got. I'm going to turn it over to Derek and Leah. Uh, great. Thank you so much, Mia. That was that was a really great intro. Um, and I'm really excited to be here and um, present some really great student work. Um, you know, one of the things that I really enjoy about uh, these classes is that it's the opportunity to sort of see really great artists um, also just add ML to the repertoire and, and see what they can make. So um, I'm really excited to show off some really great artist works um, in the session. And uh, as Mia mentioned, there will be time for Q&A. Um, at the end. So um, if you do have questions, please post those in the chat, either in Zoom or on YouTube, and we'll keep an eye on them. And then we'll have a fun little discussion at the end of this. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start sharing and um, we can take a look. I'm going to just go, uh, one, Leah, should, you should probably say hi, because Leah is going to be um, tag teaming me with this. Hey. So. Yeah, I'm Leah. Um, I'm a co-teacher with uh, the ML classes with Derek. Um, yeah. I'm an artist and AI educator, and for me, yeah, I, I think it's really important um, um, to, to teach people about machine learning and how it can be used for like really creative, cool purposes. Cool. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of history about um, our classes, so uh, as well as an intro to myself and Leah. Um, so as Mia mentioned, I'm a designer and an artist. Um, I mostly worked in generative art. Um, you know, using code to, to generate imagery and video and other artistic practices for probably about a decade now. Um, and over the past couple of years, I've really gotten interested in machine learning. Um, I've done work for the New York Times, um, Baffler Magazine. I'm sort of doing a lot of editorial illustration right now. Um, a lot of people who are interested in writing articles or like articles about machine learning or surveillance or other things. So, um, you know, I've done some, some work with the Times, um, with Baffler Magazine and uh, very soon, there'll be some work out um, in some HP, uh, like, magazines and things as well. So, um, you know, so I'm doing a lot of editorial illustration for folks, um, but I also do a lot of sort of my own work, and a lot of my own work is exploring sort of video and animation and, um, you know, some of these really quick loops that go up on Instagram, and um, some of them are longer form uh, video pieces. I'm really interested in abstract filmmaking and using machine learning to do that work. So, um, you know, really, really interested in sort of all the various aspects of machine learning and generative imagery um, and being able to find different libraries and different tools to do that. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is really important for artists coming into machine learning is that you don't need to learn to do it all yourself, right? So a lot of these tools that I use are um, libraries written from by folks who work in NVIDIA or Adobe or other places um, and learning to sort of leverage those tools for my own creative ent enterprises and, and interests. So um, that's something that we bring a lot to our to our classes. Um, and sort of this is sort of my current work. And I think a lot of people ask like, wow, this looks really amazing. How did you get into it? And how did you start doing it? And the truth is like, I struggled with it. Um, this was a lot of my earlier artwork. Um, you know, this is probably two or three years old now. And some of it is, some of the challenges were just due to technology, but some of it were all, was also due to just like, I didn't understand how machine learning worked. Um, I would see other artists using things and I'd be like, oh, that's really, really cool. And I would find out what it is. And then I would dig through source code and I would realize I don't know what Python is, or I don't know what PyTorch is, or I don't know what TensorFlow is. Um, I was really banging my head against the wall a lot of times to try to make stuff. Um, and it would feel frustrating. I would feel really slow. Um, you know, I would feel like, oh, I need to learn the source code and 
um, I quickly realized that wasn't always the case. And, um, you know, I sort of felt like I, I went through like a really frustrating phase of trying to understand machine learning because I would look up a lot of stuff and they'd be like, oh, you need to learn about tensors or, oh, you need to learn linear algebra. And I was like, I just want to make images. How do I do that? Um, so, you know, that was sort of like my experience was just sort of getting into it. Um, I have a really like fortunate experience of um, if you're in on the East Coast or maybe you're interested in art, um, there's a group called the School for Poetic Computation um, here in New York uh, run by a bunch of amazing folks. Um, and it's a really great like sort of art uh, and code and technology community um, with a really critical eye toward, you know, this sort of emerging field. Um, and I took a machine learning literacy course uh, that was taught by all of these folks. And if you're not familiar with their names, I, I highly recommend just Googling them because they're all doing really, really amazing stuff. Um, at the time, you know, Chris Valenzuela was, I believe he had just graduated from ITP and now he runs uh, Runway ML, which we'll all talk a little bit about. Um, and obviously Gene Kogan is like probably the predecessor, predecessor to my own classes. Like I found a bunch of his, um, classes on YouTube or on his own website and they sort of blew me away and I was like, oh, like this is, this is what I, everything I needed to know that I didn't realize I needed to know. Um, so, you know, all these folks are, are amazing people and I've sort of like built up like my, how I teach or how I talk about machine learning art um, from these people. Um, around a year and a half ago, <clears throat> excuse me, um, about a year and a half ago, I was uh, asked by Braulio Amato, who's um, a really great illustrator and designer um, in New York to, to teach some classes out of his um, workshop space. Um, obviously, that was when we could all actually work in a small little studio together. Um, and, you know, it was really like being asked to teach something, you know, I'm sure teachers tell you this all the time, but being asked to teach something is, was really, really, uh, it made me realize, oh, I need to like really get it together and, and do more of this stuff to like to learn more to, in order to teach more. Um, so we started teaching a class, you know, um, they put up the, the sign up for the class and I was like, oh, like three people are going to sign up for this thing. Um, and it sold out in, in a couple of days. And that was really, really amazing. Um, so uh, since then, I think we're on um, the fifth version of the class. I think we're going to do a sixth version um, next month. So like we've done some really, really cool stuff. Um, and it's all through this really great art and design community um, that's based in New York. But at the same time, like, you know, we were putting all these classes on in New York and everyone was like, can you come to San Francisco, like to teach here? Like, or can you, um, you know, come to, come to Europe and teach this? Um, and I have a full-time nine to five job, So that's like not always uh, a possibility, um, but was able to, to do a lot of this work like through New York and literally sort of understand what I wanted to do. And then um, decided like, actually at the beginning of this year that we should start to do some online classes for people. Um, and that is where Leah came in. Hey, yeah, I'm Leah. Um, so yeah, with um, uh, putting the classes online, I started, um, I joined the team with Derek and um, yeah, I sort of had a bit of background in machine learning. Um, I originally was a machine learning software engineer. So I came to this from like, um, you know, being a programmer. And then I realized that I, I wanted a lot more creativity in my day-to-day -day work. And so I went to the School for Poetic Computation in New York City, and this is me with my cohort. Um, and next slide. And then um, I also was doing some research on AI-generated artwork, and this was at NeurIPS 2019. Uh, they have a workshop on uh, machine-generated art and creativity, which is, yeah, it was my first time being around um, in, in a workshop where both, like, research scientists and artists were given the same, the same amount of space in like to present. And it was just like a really, really inspiring place. Um, and now I, yeah, th this is some, this is some of my recent work. Um, this was um, me splitting up videos of flowers blooming. I think in general, I'm interested in video generated artwork and um, yeah, producing videos and animations, especially having them synced up to, to audio. Um, other things that I'm doing lately is I'm also writing uh, articles and interviewing other AI artists. Um, recently interviewed um, this Japanese artist, Kishi Yuma, whose work very much inspires me and I, I love his work. Um, and yeah, also I am doing, um, recently published a a guide on AI ethics um, regarding like if you are making art with with AI, how to do it responsibly, how to source your data responsibly. Um, 
And that was in collaboration with a partnership on AI and a former student, Emily Saltz, and her colleague, Claire Lubius. Awesome. Yeah, so there's a couple like really um, high level tenants that we have for our artificial images classes. Um, the first thing I mentioned is like, this is for me, like it's the classes that I always wanted, but didn't have when I started out. So, um, you know, we teach a lot of intro classes, but we also teach some like higher level, like getting deep into machine learning, um, running your own servers, those sort of things. So it's really sort of like end to end and hopefully gets people at various uh, places in their, in their path. Yeah, and one thing that we really, really, um, that, that we take as kind of like a philosophy or a tenant of like the way we teach is that we want it to be a hands-on class. So our classes are grounded in learning through making and, you know, not sort of bogging down in, in the weeds of like, you know, the math and like stochastic gradient descent and like all of that stuff that can be really, really scary for someone who like, I don't know, didn't go and have, has done like research in some computer science lab. Um, yeah, we do, we do want um, this 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 like technique of using machine learning to be accessible to people who like might not have background in programming or like a math background. We want people to yeah to just like not be scared and just make a lot of stuff and get their hands dirty. Um, also, one thing we highlight a lot is that uh, is the community. Um, our classes are more than just classes. We want our students to learn from each other and sort of skill share and learn from each other. Um, yeah, we have we have a Slack channel and you know it's it's a lively community of people helping each other and filling in blanks and we really want to foster that kind of community. Yeah, and I just want to add like that was really like Leah bringing bringing her like SFPC world as well as her education background into this. Like when I taught it, when I teach like my classes, it's like here's how you do a thing, and then it is sort of like people gave us a lot of feedback that they were like, "Hey, we'd actually like to know what other people are working on," or like we'd like to meet other people doing this so that we can bounce ideas off each other. So it's really been interesting to just sort of watch it grow as a community and been really really exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even for students who don't continue making ML art um, because they're like, oh, making a data set like took me forever. Um, like being ML literate in today's world is never bad. Um, I think um, it's, 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 it's very much like for many of the students that take your class, it's like their first exposure to machine learning and like actually going through the process of like, you know, making their own data set, training their own model. Um, I think that's very valuable, especially in today's world where machine learning is like kind of everywhere. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to shout ourselves out too much, but like um, Lee and I started teaching together online in January and over the past 10 months, I guess it's been, um, we've taught a ton of classes. So, um, you know, we actually started when, when the pandemic broke out, we, we taught two classes um, at the exact same time, which was probably a bad idea, but it was a lot of fun. Um, so, you know, we cover like really a, a ton of different materials. Um, we have some general like MLR classes where you learn a little bit about uh, sort of everything, like a little runway, a little server, um, learning different types of models. Um, we've currently sort of moved to like runway ML, which is a really great sort of GUI um, it's been described as like Photoshop for uh, machine learning, even though Photoshop added their own stuff now. Um, but Romay ML is like a really great, it, it houses like 50 or 100 um, open source um, machine learning art projects into like a really helpful GUI. So we started teaching that as sort of the intro um, to our materials. Um, and then we've like, from there, people are always like, I want to learn this, I want to learn this, I want to learn this. So um, we've done classes this year on StyleGAN 2. Um, we done a class on Google Colab because one, it's free and like two, people get interested in notebooks or want to sort of play around. Um, data set creation has become a huge part of our courses because, um, you know, as artists, you want to sort of build your own data sets to make your own artwork. So um, we talk a lot about scraping and how to build your own artwork or, or data sets and those sort of things. And then um, the newest version of StyleGAN 2 came out um, two weeks ago and we started, I think it came out on a Friday and we started teaching a class on Sunday and it was gonna be just a regular StyleGAN 2 class. And then all of a sudden it was like, well, there's this new model, we might as well jump into it. So we're now teaching a StyleGAN 2 uh, ADA class, which has been a lot of fun. Um, although I'm like barely ahead of uh, our, our lesson plan, but it's been a lot of fun. And then um, 
all of these classes go up on YouTube. Um, so, you know, a month or two after the class is over, uh, we post all the lectures on YouTube and uh, people can watch them there for free um, with ads. But, um, and then I know Leah is doing a bunch of uh, speaking around her AI ethics materials, then I'm doing a lot of talks too. So it's been a very, very busy 2020 for us, even though this probably isn't our full-time job for either of us. Um, and actually I should mention, um, someone had asked about uh, Leah's AI ethics. I'll make sure we get a link um, out so that people can check out that paper. Um, and then uh, another really, really exciting part of this is, you know, I think it's sometimes it's hard for us to um, find the positives of, of this year, um, but it's been really great teaching these classes online. We've pretty much taught uh, students in just about every continent um, across the world. Um, some of our students are taking classes at like 1 a.m. with us, um, which I'm <laughs> really shocked by. I couldn't do it myself, um, but it's been really great. We've taught so many students across the world, which is just, again, like made the community that much larger and all of them are bringing their own interest to the material, which has been just really, really great uh, to experience. Um, so here's where to find both of us. Um, Artificial-images.com is probably the best place to find me and my work. Um, and you can find Leah on Twitter. Um, and I just want to give one other special heads up that um, next week on Tuesday, I'll be doing a StyleGAN 2 ADA workshop. Um, so it is like a three-week-old model. So we'll dig into uh, during images and video using StyleGAN 2. Um, and you can find more info on the Twimmel Fest website. And with that, um, I know we went a little over time. So I'm really excited to hand off um, the, the sort of mic and, and the screen share um, to Esteban, Nauco, Adam, and April, who have all been really, really nice. And um, thankful, I'm really thankful that they were able to present their work. Um, so I'm really excited to sort of show you their work. Each of them is an amazing artist in and of themselves. Um, and they're bringing their own viewpoints and their own experiences um, to the work, which is really, really exciting. So um, I'm going to stop sharing because I have some bios to read. Um, but please keep the, uh, the questions coming because it's really great to see um, from everyone. Um, so with that, I will start um, and just introduce um, Esteban. So Esteban Salgado is a Brooklyn-based designer and artist focusing on graphic design, generative art, and machine learning. He is a School of Visual Arts alum and has worked as an art director and designer. His work has been exhibited internationally in group and solo shows at the Ibero-American Biennial Design uh, Biennial Biennial of Design in Madrid, uh, Global Mix Japan, among any other, many others. Um, and currently he is exploring new boundaries in art with the aid of artificial intelligence. Um, and I think Esteban has a uh, recorded video of his work. So we'll go ahead and take a look at that now. I think we're having a little trouble with the sound, so we're going to start it over, but thanks for bearing with us, guys. Recreate. Hi, thank you. Of, of my artistic practice, uh, I did a lot of analog collage. Uh, I was interested in the idea of combining parts and ideas and images. And then later on, I took this 
same concept to uh, generative art. I was trying to recreate the same experience while generating these abstract shapes. Then I, I took this amazing uh, course with Derek about machine learning. And then I started creating these new ways of art, uh, at least for me, which are uh, these animated pieces uh, of colors and, and shapes. One of the things that I do when I, uh, I, while I'm doing machine learning is, is that I, I create my own data sets. I don't use images from other people. At least I don't, I don't try to do that. So most of the time I am creating my own artwork and then training them to see the results. Another thing that I do uh, while doing machine learning is combining uh, those experiences, those animations with sound. I collaborate with uh, musicians and, and I, try, I try to see what, what happened when you, when, you, when you have sound next to it. It would be great to, to have some tools to generate um, audio as well. In, in, in a new series called Fragments, um, you can see here on the left 1000 images that I created manually. And then on the, on the right, you see one detail of those. What I do is um, create these paintings that are moving and transforming. Uh, the thing that I like about these is that I don't have control over the result. The only, the only control that I have is, is creating the data set and then after that, the results could be anything. Um, then later on, I, I was asking myself, what if uh, my own art could generate some kind of consciousness uh, represented by faces or these personas that, does, that doesn't exist? So the, the idea of, of that art could create these uh, characters uh, it's appealing to me. Another area that I'm exploring right now is uh, how can I create some kind of materiality uh, using sound uh, as a source? Uh, this is sound some uh, sound reaction pieces that I did. Um, sometimes I use uh, algorithms uh, that are based on machine learning and sometimes I use other software like Touch Designer to um, combine that with, uh, with my models. Uh, the results could be really, really unexpected and, and I'm really having fun <laughs> doing this. Uh, one last uh, thing that I, I would like to share with you today is this series called Jan Canates inspired in the, by the Andean mountains where I grew up. And it's a combination of uh, colors and volume and, and these abstract shapes. Um, I, the, the thing that is really interesting in this is that I can, I can almost feel and touch these pictures. And that's, that's something that I would like to push forward uh, in my work. Well, thank you so much for uh, having me here. I would like to uh, thank uh, Derek and Leah. They were fantastic uh, during this process of learning uh, these amazing tools. So thank you so much and have a great day. Great, thanks so much, Esteban. Um, so next we are going to um, move to Naoko. So Naoko Hara is a Japanese 2D animator and artist based in NYC. I will hand it off to you, Naoko. Okay, yeah, great. Uh, thank you, Derek, for that intro. Uh, so, hi, I'm Naoko, and it's pronounced the way it is written on the screen. Uh, as Derek has mentioned, I am um, a 2D animator by day, 
I'm also a designer. Um, uh, my focus is uh, motion graphics. And I'm also an artist by night. And uh, right now, I'm, my focus is machine learning and some photogram work on the side. And a fun fact is I am also a martial arts practitioner. So uh, I've taken maybe four classes with Derek and Leah this year. And um, it's been a lot of fun. Um, I learned how to use Runway, Google Colab, and Derek's uh, data set tools library. So I'm gonna start off with some next frame prediction experiments that I've done. So majority of my work is uh, video or animation based. So naturally I was interested to see what a video based notebook like next frame prediction would produce. So here are um, uh, three examples. I've been using snippets of my animation work as the input source. And I'm interested in seeing how different um, the notebook output would be from what I've already animated. And uh, oftentimes the outcome is pretty unexpected. And it's very inspiring to see what, um, what a machine could produce and how different it thinks. Um, so yeah, and I'm really excited to use these as like some jumping off points for future projects or you know, maybe like try to recreate these in After Effects, which is uh, my primary uh, program. Uh, and also just as a general note, uh, for a lot of the notebooks, the likelihood of me, me being satisfied with the output, uh, the output video um, as is like right out of the box is maybe 50-50. So I'm definitely not against doing some like post work, like color correction, masking, or even overlaying a few videos to achieve a certain look. So like something like this in the middle, this was uh, three videos combined. And uh, yeah, like maybe some color correction here and there. So yeah, I think um, it's like, it feels like I'm collaborating with the machine if I, uh, yeah, doing some, it, it's like a conversation in a way. So moving on, uh, Shape Matching Gun is another notebook that I've been playing with. And for these three, uh, I used the still frame from an animation that is very texture heavy. And I used that as the input source, played around with some masking options. Uh, yeah, the, the map option, excuse me. Um, and made it loop in post. And uh, sometimes I string together a few notebooks together. So um, like I would make something in Shape Matching Gan, uh, stick it in Next Screen Prediction and see what that combination would produce. Okay. And then some StyleGAN works. Um, so StyleGAN was one of the first models that I have played with in Runway. And Runway was the first uh, program, machine learning program that I, uh, that I learned. And so the one on the left is, uh, it, use, it uses footage uh, that I shot as the data set. So I used still frames from that and, um, uh, did some post work to that and then turned that into uh, the data set. And it has a very Sumi ink like quality to it, uh, the output. So uh, I was very uh, attracted, that, attracted to that aesthetic. And similarly, uh, the one on the right is also footage based. Uh, so the data set was um, close up, uh, close ups of flowers, but using a makeshift macro lens attachment for my phone. So uh, because uh, the, the lens attachment was made from paper and like a cheap lens, it creates, it, uh, creates this natural chromatic aberration. And so this was um, a prototype that my friend slash uh, my former teacher Kelly Anderson has sent me. So shout out to her if she's listening right now. And so for the one in the middle, this 
Um, I also have a quick live demo for this one right after this. Um, the data set was based on famous 20th century lamp designs. And uh, I've gotten a couple questions in the past where people are like, why lamps? And a lot of my work is uh, high contrast. Um, lighting is very important. And so when I was first making this data set, I was like, well, why not go to the source and look into some, um, you know, well-known uh, lamp designs. So I'm gonna do a quick live demo here. Okay. So from that, uh, the lamp style again, I made a website and you can actually just type something. And of course it needs to kick in first. <laughs> so, should have done this first. So, um, there we go. So it creates and it, or it spits back um, a lamp based on whatever you type. So you can type full sentences. You could be, it could be a single word. So let's do, um, let's pick up one for, uh, So you can type whatever and it spits back lamp. And these are all just, they're all based on 20th century lamp designs. And yeah, so um, this will, I haven't actually published this yet, but I think it will be going up very shortly so people can play around with it. And yeah, that is it for my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. And thank you, uh, Derek and Leah for this amazing opportunity. And I've been enjoying your classes very much. Cool. Thanks so much, Naoko. Um, so we're going to move over to Adam. So Adam Pickard is an interdisciplinary uh, art director based in Toronto. His work has appeared in DNAD, Communication Arts, uh, Fadon's A Smile in the Mind, and is a part of SF MoMA's permanent collection. So Adam, we'll hand it over to you. Well, I'm going to share my screen. Um, yeah, we can see that. Uh, so yeah, I'm an art director uh, based in Toronto. I discovered Derek's class, uh, uh, Derek and Lee's class during kind of like uh, COVID and like as everybody was trying to like figure a way to like better themselves, I thought this was a great opportunity to explore something I was really interested in, which is machine learning. Uh, so, so yeah. Um, and I like, I think one thing I'm specifically like coming from a design perspective, I'm interested in machine learning as a tool. So not just specifically for art, which I went to school with for as well, but as well, like how it can be used as a tool, sort of a little bit more in the, in the design world. So one of the first things I did playing around with data sets was I created one with imagery that is from stained glass windows from like a church. And I found it really interesting. And what I did with it after was like, I've played around with 3D. So I was interested in this, the result here, but also interested in bringing it a little bit more in the physical world. I've done some AR stuff and I was kind of like, how do we take it from this thing that exists there and bring it a little bit more physical? So in this case, um, using volumetric lighting and Cinema 4D, I played around with a bit of taking like a model and making it like, let's say real and more physical. So that's part of one of the interests I have is like some of the models I've worked with, I'd love to take them as, because they're quite often photographs or images of real world things and then become part of uh, the like part of a machine learning data set. It'd be great to be able to bring them back into the physical world in some form. Uh, but right now it's it's uh, varying degrees, but I, I, I thought that this was a simple way to kind of explore that. Um, and so that kind of brings me to like a, the main thing I've been kind of interested in, which is like 
machine learning as a tool. And like, I think Derek mentioned earlier, like we're, we, we just saw in the version of Photoshop that came out yesterday that they're very much introducing it as a tool uh, that you'll just be able to play around with sliders and stuff and do all your stuff. But um, I was sort of interested in that. So one of the first things I played around with was uh, with a tool that was my intro before taking Derek's class, which is Runway. So this is an, uh, I took the letters uh, that spell out Runway and made a giant data set, separate data set in StyleGAN for each one. So we're roughly talking about a thousand images for each one of these, or at least a thousand images for each one, some of them up to like 5,000 for each one that I scraped. And then the result was a text, which we can see here that um, I was interested with them with creating a low coming from design, creating a logo type that would never be the same twice. So, but it was a little bit overkill, but the idea of having a machine learning model for each one of these letters individually means that uh, it would <laughs> almost for sure never look the twi uh, look the same twice sort of thing. So it was, it was something that um, I did for them. Uh, as well, I think there seems to be uh, a, uh, an interest within the machine learning world with chairs. And I have some ideas about it, but like, uh, I don't know, like it seems to be a thing. Everybody in machine learning or a lot of people in machine learning want to play around with chairs. So that's my, uh, some of the images from my data set in the background. And these are some of the resulting images. Um, I've got an interest in industrial design and stuff and I've done some work around that world. So uh, it made sense, but uh, I think partly because there's a large, there's an ongoing discussion about whether or not there's too many chairs and not enough chairs or uh, should people stop making chairs. And I think the world of chairs is kind of interesting specifically in generative design. And so this was something I played around with. That was obviously uh, Eames Lounge on the left and that was my model using projection from machine learning on the right. Um, my result obviously is slightly more office looking and cozy, but I think it's it, it's kind of an interesting exploration of like how you could input an image on the left of something you're inspired by and then see what your specifically model uh, on the right would result in. As well, um, uh, this is an example of using feature vectors how an interface could work within a model. So this is within my model itself, uh, a couple of vectors. One is uh, I've identified as smooth and one is span. Uh, the one below is loft and the one below that uh, you'll see in a sec is kind of organic. And I think we started to see some of these kinds of design approaches in uh, in the new version of like Photoshop and stuff. And I think that's kind of like, I imagine for, especially for designers, I'm, I'm all for learning as much as I can, but you know, quite often we're just trying to, to, to be creative and get things done. And I think interfaces like this might be something that we, we could often see. The, uh, you probably won't hear this, but what this actually is, is like uh, me or, or, or voice yelling and we're using an autoreactive element to how the, it changes the specific, uh, I don't know if you heard that or not, but it was like the idea of yelling uh, at again, which I thought was kind of interesting, which is like, instead of just a, a GUI that's like just sliders, but what happens if you could express yourself, the, the feeling, like, could you sing to your GAN is basically what I'm thinking of. It's like, could you sing your way to a design, which I thought was kind of interesting, like a different way to interact with design than the way that we commonly talk about with sliders and such. Um, and then this is something else I was playing around with, uh, potential issues we need to consider and stuff. And one is obviously ergonomics. So if we're gonna be showing a design, if we're gonna be creating things using these platforms, we need to think about things. And, as someone who's dealt with back issues and stuff like that, I have a big interest in ergonomics. Um, uh, this sounds weird, but I'll give context for it. GANs for <laughs> forensics. Um, essentially, like I'm, this is a, a well-known Canadian artist called Emily Carr. This is the painting I grew up with. 
Um, I, on my family and everybody I knew always believed that this was a real Emily Carr because we bought it from a gallery, a reputable gallery that said it was Emily Carr. Um, uh, the question over time, when we tried a uh, long story, I'll make it short. Uh, we're not sure if it's real. So it became this thing where like I, uh, at some point I was playing Ralph imagery because it was a big part of my childhood. The art school I went to was named after her. And so I became interested in the difference between the, uh, the, the real and the fake and that um, if machine learning can really learn a style or learn artists work so well, what would that space be that exists between the two? So like if, if like what does this look like in between here if we can understand the artist so much and is this, it's not really clear if this is real or fake. So what does this look like? So using a, a method of uh, within the, the um, style gain two library, I did something called projection, uh, which I think I may have shown before uh, with a chair, but in this case took the painting, then took my library and resulted in uh, and did projection into the model, which I trained on all of her work. Um, and so this is sort of the result that I've landed in. This is like a place that I'm like, I'm still playing around with. This is the original painting that I grew up with. And this was the projected result of a whole bunch of work here. Um, I've as well started working with what Derek was talking about with the Stalgan 2 ADA model. And um, I've got something, I've got some results I'm really excited about. So I'm going to be taking this and updating it with what my results are from the ADA model. So yeah, that's me. Awesome. Thanks so much, Adam. So we have one person left. Um, I know that we are running a little short on time, so make sure you put in some questions um, now. And after April, we'll we'll jump into the Q and A. Um, so April um, April Sotarman is an interdisciplinary artist, designer, and writer who creates narrative installations, public art, games, and immersive theater. Her site responsive work plays with the language of everyday objects and speculative institutions to explore complex human emotions. You can find her work at April Soderman, uh, Sotarman com and her previously anonymous street art at weirder at weirdsideprojects.com. Um, and she's also at April Sotarman um, on the internet. So April, I will hand it off to you. Cool. All right. Thanks, Derek. Um, let me see. Cool. It's working. We're good. All right. Hey, so hi, I'm April Sotarman. Um, as I mentioned, for some background, I'm an installation artist and narrative designer. Um, my work is very physical, sometimes with text, public art, street art, sculpture. Um, but the project I'm going to talk about today, um, I do a lot of travel sketching as a hobby. Uh, it's a habit left over from architecture school. Um, it's a way of recording places I've been and also how I felt at the time. Because uh, on location sketching is like this act of creating intentional memory. It's very personal and very meditative. Uh, so when I go through my sketchbook again, they're like little recall points. And it's important for me that they're not drawn from photos. Uh, it's also the clearest way of connecting what I see with my eyes to what I make with my hands. And so I have dozens of these sketchbooks from the past eight years. Um, so the goal here was to train my travel sketches, a record of places I have been, uh, to create a machine learning model of places I haven't been and can never go to, these, these imaginary places, essentially. So unfortunately, past me did not optimize for creating a data set. Um, my style changes depending on how much time I have. Sketches take from three minutes to over an hour. Um, it depends what tools I have on hand and it's evolved over time. You know, I use different pens and I, I draw on different things as too. too. Um, so in this first version, I scrape these photos to my Instagram and also out of my storage, a uh, cloud storage. And I crop the photos to show the location in the top third, as you can see, and the sketchbook in the bottom two thirds of the frame. And as you can see, I, when I took the photos, I had it kind of reflect the content with the sketch itself. So there's like windows in this sketch and then there you can see windows in the photo. There's the ocean in the sketch, ocean in the photo. Um, and with all that processing though, that only left me about 400 images, uh, including mirroring. And I trained it for 5,000 steps in runway ML. So here are some of the results. Uh, it was kind of su a surprise. Like I actually like how the background photo image does correlate with the generated landscape. Uh, the one on the left here is probably my favorite. Um, and the middle one kind of seems like a river at sunset and a warm day with like these rock formations rising out of it. Um, here's some more results where they were trying to draw a building. 
Um, as you can see, there's columns and windows and colors, and you can kind of see entrances in the sketch as well. And, you know, so these, these almost buildings. Um, so I made a second data set. It's, it's similar to the first one, but it's more buildings and it's more architectural. So it's, it's the drawing only. Um, and I also removed some of the blobby watercolor landscapes. Um, so you, as you can see in these sketches over here, there's windows, columns, roofs, stairs, a lot of horizontal and vertical lines. Um, and again, around 400 photos, 5,000 steps trained in runway ML. So here are some of the buildings. And yes, they do look like buildings, right? Like in, in this bottom left over here, there's like a ground floor, a rooftop terrace. This top sketch, it's like some building rising out of a forest with trees growing around it. And some of the colors are showing up. Um, and here are the ones that look less like buildings. Like there's, this is more of a landscape and over here, um, this bottom left one kind of looks like a Lord of the Rings style bridge. Um, so the next part, uh, drawing in real life, getting off the screen. So here's one of the generated images. Uh, it looks like a bridge and actually kind of looks like something I, I would have drawn. It, it, it's, I would say it's closer to something I actually would have drawn. Um, so I took that image, live traced it in Illustrator and then had my vinyl cutter draw it with a pen. Um, so this is the first one, just using a black felt tip pen. And then I actually went through multiple iterations with the same file uh, using a black pen, an ink brush. Uh, this one has two layers. Uh, first layer is black pen and then a gray brush pen or this um, ink brush and water brush combination. And these are the actual tools I would use while sketching on location. And uh, each one of these took maybe 10 minutes to set up and then two to four minutes to draw, which I will say is much faster than I am. And of course, it's a little different than how I actually draw, but you know, we're, we're getting there. <laughs> um, so the, kind of the next step for this project was, for this project, would I'd, I'd want to use the pen plotter to draw more of these images in watercolor and, and create a bound book, uh, like this artifact that you can flip through side by side next to my actual sketchbook, you know. Um, so I like how these turned out, uh, but it's kind of like that movie Memento, you know, when that main character sees a note in his own handwriting and he doesn't remember how it got there. So it's, it's kind of like seeing pages from a journal I never wrote and a, a drawing set in a place I've never been to. So sometimes it's a little weird, um, but a bit of a coda. Um, so I made this project when I took Derek's class back in May and uh, two months into lockdown, I was not in any mood to go out and sketch or really create anything at all. It was, it was really hard. Um, so actually the process of creating a machine learning data set where I just sit there and just crop hundreds of images one by one was literally one of the most soothing but still productive things I could do. You know, just like podcast or album, just like crop and save and review and just next. Um, so yeah, and then I could just press a button and generate hundreds more of them immediately after the model was framed. And of course I'm still involved in the creative process. Like I made the data set after all, and I'm still picking and curating the images. Um, but this idea when I, I couldn't really draw at the time, but I could still make this art, you know, I could still be a part of this artistic process with a little help. And then of course, over the summer, I started going out and drawing again. Um, but in, in this like creative practice, it's, it's really great to have like many toys in the box to play with and, and machine learning as a, another artistic medium to like use or collaborate with. I mean, work in some like machine learning assisted writing right now trained on my previous writing. Um, and, and looking back, like being stuck in lockdown, unable to travel or be in the right space or headspace, um, this ability to run this little sketch generator and draw these imaginary other places and explore this peaceful alternate world, it was actually very comforting. <laughs> so thank you. And, and thanks again, Derek and Leah for teaching such an amazing class. Awesome, thank you so much, April. That was a great, uh, great wrap up for um, this session. So um, we do have about 10 minutes for questions. So um, go ahead and put them in the chat, um, either on YouTube or on Zoom. And um, we'll go ahead and I've got some, I've got one to start off with for, for everyone. So um, if you don't mind turning on your screens, people can see you. Um, I'm really interested in, you know, so I think all of you do amazing work just even outside of, um, of machine learning. And I'm really interested to hear more from you about, you know, I think Adam touched on this a little bit about what he thinks the future is, but for each of you, what do you think the future is of, of using machine learning in your own art, artistic process? Um, and I'll start with uh, April since your mic is on, you go ahead and go first. I mean, as I said, I think as just like another tool to 
play with like you like roll the dice you know like back when people would use like I Ching or like other things to just like generate or like a deck of playing cards or things like that um I really like using personal data sets like I've, I've played with like creating other data sets but I really like using my own work in the ways that it like reveals patterns and also like how when the machine will throw you something and sometimes you'll be like oh that's me and sometimes it will not you'll be like no that's not me and then you like understand your own work even more um so i don't know i just I'm, i work on some like tech stuff right now with machine learning so yeah my 14 year old blog posts so there we go um now I'll, I'll ask you next like what are you sort of interested in in doing next Yes, uh, um, I briefly touched on it too during my presentation, but I think it's really inspiring to see what a machine uh, predicts, like especially something for something like uh, next screen prediction where, you know, you've already, like I've already animated it, but like what would a machine think like if I were to put that animation in? So I feel like, um, you know, looking at what, look at the output video would um, give me some more like ideas to work on. and. Like right now I'm doing, um, I'm using uh, YouTube and uh, Canny, like from your data set uh, library and kind of um, using those, like combining those two with my uh, like photograph work. So I feel like it's a nice um, like collaboration in a way. Perfect, um, Esteban. Uh... Adam, you already answered, so I'm gonna skip you, but Esteban, I'm interested to hear from you. Sure. Um, as an artist, I see that uh, in the future, probably we will be able to interact with these models, probably light sculptures or something that are created for people to have in their houses, and they could probably decide how they want to see the art. And I see that um, myself creating these models for people to enjoy art. And, and I feel like machine learning could be a really good tool for that. Not only as a creators creating an, our own artwork, but as a creators to engage people to create their, their own artwork. Um, I see that light is a, is a big concept here. Uh, I would love to, to start playing with that uh, via projections maybe. Um, maybe something that I can combine with, with uh, machine learning models. That would be awesome to, to do in the future, for sure. And also the other thing that I've been doing is combining um, machine learning with touch designer before and, and seeing what happened next. Maybe combining all these tools uh, could lead us to a different, different outcome, for sure, yeah. Awesome, um, so Scott has a question in the chat of, um, your thoughts on other ways to augment creativity with ML. So Adam, um, maybe I'll start with you since uh, it seems like you've got lots of different ways to augment your own creativity, but what are, what are some other ways you think might, might be coming up in the future? Um, I, I'm just like, so I think for context, like I'm interested in like the like amount of new models that like a research that keeps happening every day. And I feel like there's always part of my inspiration is seeing things that I would imagine, but every once in a while seeing like, uh, there's a few Twitter accounts, but like I can see a new model that shows a really cool thing. And then eventually that model, the code gets released and then I get to play around with it. And sometimes it's exciting. And sometimes it's, it's not as exciting as the researcher makes it look like it's exciting. So I, I think that, yeah, I think for, like I'm, I'm interested in that in, in that space of like uh, it, and I'm also interested in like also the space between like the weirdness between like a, a computer trying to mimic a human and its ability. So that space that like it's maybe not quite a person, and so you're gonna get some weirdness in that. And sometimes in that space, there there's something fun to play around with, like creatively. Great. Um, before I ask that question of a couple other folks, um, Adam, Alan had a question of, do you think your GAN can point to a criteria for a painting being a fake one um, with respect to an artist's work? So I think this is sort of maybe getting into the, some of the forensics works that you've been thinking about. So probably like not yet, but I'm, that's like something I'm exploring and I'm interested in because like the idea of the, the like machine learning, like it, it like, as much as I understand if, if it replicates a style or 
understands an artist style and obviously that depends on the amount of artwork it makes um like where within that model does a painting exist or not exist and i think that's something i'm really interested in but i don't know if like it, it i don't know if that will work or not but i'm i'm really interested in whether or not it could work or not Perfect. Um, so I want to sort of go back to a little bit of the other creative inputs. So April, you mentioned you're working with text. Can you talk a little bit about how you think about like, uh, I think you've mentioned it as sort of your toolbox, like text, image, um, you know, how are you thinking about augmenting your own creativity? Uh, that's a tricky question because I, I definitely start with like narrative and story first. And so like this one, this particular, this, this piece was helpful because I was thinking it was like, oh, what would it be like if you like woke up in a dream and you had like a book of like places that you like had seen in a dream or something. And then of course machine learning fits for that. So I don't, I don't, I can't really answer how I would like be like, oh, machine learning first. Cause I definitely start with like my kind of like a feeling or like, oh, of, like what does it mean to like think about this world or this thing? And like, I start with that first before I go into it. But I kind of, I like, knowing about all the things that are possible right now because then you're like oh now I know this is this is a thing that will like fit with the concept I already have um so some of the tech stuff is just the with text is is really interesting because again like generating alternate universe like high school history blog posts or like alternate universe me from 10 years ago blog posts and have them like talk to each other and be like was I like this or like what am I like now like kind of like a weird mirror to like what who you are as a person now but I, I can't I can't really say how it would be like machine learning first rather than like oh now it'll like be there and I could like pull it out yeah no I think that's great to think about machine learning not as just the beginning but as like a way to get to an end result that you're already thinking about so that makes sense um Esteban I'm really interested in like your work like I've seen your work like uh, for the past year, like you've explored so much and I'm really interested to hear a little bit about what you're thinking about with audio and how you work with both other people as well as sharing your own audio and where that, where you think that can lead to a new world for creativity. Yeah, fr from the beginning, uh, I decided to start working with sound. It was like two things that were together from the very, very beginning. So I started collaborating with uh, musicians from the UK, from LA, and we started designing these experiences. Uh, sometimes I gave them the model or the animation and they interpret the music, the sound that will go with that piece or the opposite. They will give me the sound and I will play with it to do, to do some uh, sound reactions. One important thing about this is that, um, and, and this is this connected with your previous question with the one you were talking about is that we are playing with senses. We are, we are playing with emotions. So every time that I see my pieces, I feel like my brain is changing the way it processes things. I feel like uh, I see the colors in a different way. I feel like I don't see animations anymore that are linear or, or animations that have some kind of logic behind it. It's more about interpreting the feelings and the, and the sensations that you have when you, when you see machine learning art. That's in my case, because I'm interested in doing art uh, and trying to express these uh, emotions and these feelings. Uh, I received a, a comment uh, in the couple, uh, two days ago from one person in, in Switzerland. And she said that she, she has synesthesia. I don't know if that's the the right way of saying it. So she asked me, uh, you know, I have these feelings, these weird feelings that I, that, that I have when I see your, your, your animations. And could you explain if you have the same situation when you are creating this? And I told her, yes, I, I can feel the texture. I can, I, I mean, I interpret the colors in a different way. That's why I use a lot of colors. So I think we should, uh, we, we can experiment a little bit more in that way, not only about creating a product to sell something or to achieve uh, a great tool, let's say in Photoshop. It, this could be more about how can people can be engaged with the experience of feeling or, or, or having art somehow, as I said before, through light. So, to answer your question, I, I feel like sound 
is one of the components very, very important for, for all these things. Later on, I would love to experience with light for sure. That's great. I also like, as you were talking about emotion, I imagine like some sort of GAN for emotions, like this emotion does not exist or like we're recreate, we're like creating new emotions that we've never seen before. Um, so we're at time now, I'm going to wrap up with you and I'm just going to, I want to ask a little bit, like, since you're an animator and you do video and these sort of things, like um, maybe this ties in a little bit to April's of like, do you think about these before or after, or like, what do you see as maybe the future of video generation and other things? Because I think that's sort of a newer, or like there'll be a newer field uh, to appear in the world. Um, yeah, so like April said, like I definitely agree with uh, like the tool set part of, of uh, what she said. And I also kind of think of it as, maybe it's definitely not the first thing I think about, like that I would make something, um, like I would animate something and then it's like, oh, well, how, a lot of it is like, oh, well, what do I need to do to achieve this concept or like this specific aesthetic or look? And and um, like, I think a lot of the, like the notebooks that I've used, like I was gravitated towards them because it, it was like one of the puzzle pieces that I was missing that I couldn't hand animate it or like drop a plug in or whatever, right? And um, and again, it's very much unexpected. Like you can't really control this thing. A lot of it is noise. Um, so like I would have to edit things out, but then it's such an interesting way to like integrate hand animation and, or like footage that you've shot and like run it through and see what happens. So um, yeah, so uh, to answer your question, did I, answer my, did I answer your question probably? Um, yeah, um, it's, uh, I, I still do think of it as like, like an unexpected and like a very fun collaboration like of like human and machine. Um, and yeah, I, I just, I wouldn't probably like, oh, well, like I said earlier, like I wouldn't, um, most of the times I wouldn't uh, just use the video like out of the box and I would end up, definitely like manipulating it um, to my liking so it would fit into my video pieces or it could be a standalone piece that would fit in with the rest of my work. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we're at time. So I just really want to I want to thank um, all the participants for today's um, talk. So thanks to my co-teacher, Leah, um, and thanks to Nauco, April, Esteban, and Adam um, for taking time of their day to share their work. Um, so if you are interested in learning more about sort of machine learning for art, um, I'd probably recommend uh, checking out the artificial-images.com, which is sort of um, a repo of my work, as well as um, links to uh, our YouTube resources, as well as uh, we announce classes through there um, as well. So, um, and you can check out Leah's work as well on um, Twitter. So uh, thanks to Mia again for organizing this and making sure that uh, we're on time and that everything is uh, set up correctly. Um, but thanks again uh, to the 12 folks. This has been a lot of fun. Um, and I learned a lot about my own students' work. So um, I've got some good competition. It's nice to like make uh to train people and like then all of a sudden be like oh now i have to step up my work to to keep up with them so um thanks again thank you so much derek um you said a lot of what i wanted to say um a big thank you to you and leah and to all of your lovely students for sharing esteban naoko adam and april that was awesome and super fascinating for everyone so um and thank you everyone for attending and for your questions I do want to mention that the video will be available on the session page where you joined and on YouTube and our YouTube channel. So keep an eye on that if you want to reference anything. Um, and also that Derek will be doing a StyleGAN workshop uh, next week on Tuesday, October 27th at 2.30 Pacific, 5.30 Eastern. Um, so if you're interested and you want to get a taste of some of what the course is like and uh, get started, that'll be kind of an overview of StyleGAN 2. Um, and how to get it running in Google Colab. And I think there's gonna be a lot of exploration happening. We do have limited space in that workshop though. So make sure you express your interest. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, everyone. This was awesome. And I'm so excited. I'm probably gonna go back and rewatch um, all the cool stuff we looked at. So thank you so much for your time. Um, 